little bit about the um, discoveries and observations I've made so far as part of my PhD project exploring the women of the shirt making industry in Derry between 1951 and 1971. So overall, I'm going to argue that Derry is a city of many contradictions, both in the, in the way that it remembers the shirt making industry and also how it actually analyzes it in, in popular discourse. Some of the contradictions that I have um, come across so far in the study can be somewhat explained um, by the complicated nature of the study. Uh, to be honest, we can't even agree on the name. Uh, Derry is Northern Ireland's second largest city. Um, it's about a two hour drive away from the capital of Belfast. It's officially known as London Derry, um, but the city is actually called Derry by its mostly Catholic nationalist population and also by the local city council as well. Um, to avoid controversy, some people call it Derry Stroke London Derry, or by its Irish name of Dura, um, or the nicknames the Maiden City or Stroke City, um, but locals also call it Legendary as well. Now, Derry has a long and illustrious history of shirt making on both sides of the river. Um, however, the history is ultimately a tale of deindustrialization in an already economically deprived area. Um, at its height, the shirt making industry had 40 factories, uh, mostly located on the city side, which is the right hand side there of, of the image and the surrounding um, residential areas. The mostly female workforce has led the legacy of the industry to be inextricably linked with discussions on gender and gender roles. So throughout the period of 1951 to 1971, the employment dominance of the shirt making industry in the city is clear. At its height, over a quarter, 27% of all economically active people actually worked in the shirt factories. And even with the decline of the industry throughout the period, there were still 1,249 people who worked in the factories. So all throughout this time frame, um, female employment far outnumbered male employment. And you can see even at its lowest point, there were 919 more females working in the industry than men. When analysing the figures, it's clear um, to see why the shirt making industry is and has been inextricably linked to women. Um, the blunt analysis um, uh, made in 1971 by the Northern Ireland Community Relations Commission that too many women work in Derry can be somewhat corroborated by images here that you can see on screen of the steady stream of women sent in the stairs of Tilly and Henderson shirt factory. The statement itself is somewhat indicative of the times as well. Um, where male, un uh, male employment uh, was really the priority for statutory bodies. But in the interviews that I've con conducted so far, there's a real sense of pride um, from the women who worked in the factories and the fact that they were either breadwinners or at least um, wage earners for their families. Isabel Doherty really sums up the sentiments um, of many others that I've talked to and saying, when I think about it now, women were the mainstay of our city. Yet when we analyse the number of women who worked in the factories versus the Northern Ireland average, Derry wasn't really far out of step with those figures. It's only in the 1971 census uh, where we can see a significant deviation from the Northern Irish figures. Even female employment in general is not considerably different from the rates of female employment in Belfast and in Northern Ireland in general. But Derry is still seen as a place apart by, by its people. Um, the popular belief that women's employment uh, maintained the city prevails. It's even immortalized in song um, in Phil Coulter's The Town I Love So Well. Even those men I've interviewed who work in the shirt factories, um, they emphasize the, the legacy uh, of the shirt making industry really belongs to women. Adrian Ross, who was the manager of Welsh Margison's factory, really sums it up here um, when he says, the women are the stars of the show. They kept the city alive. Former shirt factory employee Claire Moore also sums up the generalization of the impact of the working women on the local economy when she says the factory girls really kept the economy going. But how can this perception and popular belief be explained? Throughout the period, Derry experienced a crisis and male unemployment that saw levels consistently above the Northern Irish and Belfast County Borough areas. The most striking figure is that of 1971, where 19% of men, men in the city of Derry were unemployed versus the Northern Irish average of 10%.
memory work carried out by the dairy community about deindustrialization in general, it's, it's a quite a complex picture. Unlike the case of Moulinex highlighted by Clark, the men of Derry are dispropor disproportionately visible as victims of the times. The deindustrialization of the city further exposed the underlying unemployment issue that unfortunately still exists today. Despite this, the shirt making industry continues to have significant cultural saliency, similar to that at the height of the coal mining industries in England, Scotland and Wales. The memory of the industry is moulded and presented by the people of the city and the former factory workers themselves, um, even to this day. I would like to just conclude by exploring the contradictions of the legacy of the shirt making industry in the city of Derry. Unlike many of the other industrial cities throughout the island of Ireland and the UK, Derry has not experienced the same levels of gentrification of former factory sites. As observed by Hai and Lewis in Corporate Wasteland, those factories have been demolished or lay in ruin, um, have united the former factory workers in a memory community of anger and sorrow. However, participants in my study have not wanted to dwell on these emotions. Instead, they choose to frame their narrative around their personal recollections, personal experiences, in an almost nostalgic fashion. The contribution of the mostly female workforce of the shirt making industry are simultaneously over remembered and under remembered in the city. Over remembered as the employment figures don't corroborate the popular memory, but under remembered as the cultural and economic significance of the industry has not really been officially memorialized by the local authorities. Despite this lack of official memorial, the legacy of the industry is celebrated in popular memory and through a number of small community created pieces of public history. It's the words of the women of the shirt making industry themselves that reflects the high esteem bestowed on the shirt factories by those who have worked in them or by those who have had family members who work in them. It's really summarized best by Claire Murr when she says, I think I speak for many when I say with pride, we are factory girls. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to the questions later on. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you. Um, beautiful presentation. Um, next up is uh, Rory. Uh, Rory Stride is uh, a postgrad at um, the Scottish Oral History Centre here at the University of Strathclyde. Um, Rory's family have deep roots in Govan. Uh, Govan is a working class uh, shipbuilding district on the south side of the city here. And uh, Rory is interested in how individual lives, communities, and political discourse continue to be profoundly shaped by deindustrialization in Scotland, Europe, uh, and North America. Specifically, Rory is interested in the experience of deindustrialization and its long term consequences on women in West Central Scotland's once uh, thriving textile sector. With his doctoral research exploring this issue through a case study exam examination of uh, four textile companies uh, in the region. Over to you, Rui. Hey, thanks very much, Arthur. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just want to thank the organisers of today's session. I'm, I'm really pleased and, and grateful to be able to uh, participate. Uh, I, I don't have a, a PowerPoint presentation, so I'm afraid you'll, you'll just have to, to listen as, as I don't have any uh, visual aids. I want to touch briefly on, on two key issues this afternoon uh, through the, the lens of my own research on women and deindustrialization in the textile industry in, in West Central Scotland. Firstly, on the centrality of industrial work to women's identity. And secondly, how we better mainstream knowledge of, of women's experiences of deindustrialization in the popular imagination and popular conceptions of the industrialization. Women's work has been and continues to be across all sectors of the economy chronically undervalued. In Scotland and across the global north, the biggest sector in which women engaged in industrial employment throughout the 20th century was the textile industry. Yet typically, women's work in the sector was classified as unskilled or low skilled. Why is women's industrial work in the textile sector so commonly and so readily dismissed as unskilled or low skilled? Like all industries, there was a labour hierarchy in the textile industry, which was evident in the factory floor. For example, in the clothing factories, women working on sewing machines were graded from grade one to grade three, 
based on the speed of their work and the quality of its execution. To succeed, sewn machinists were required to possess remarkable dexterity, precision, and speed. This was not work that anyone could do, particularly without any training. It was skilled labour. In the D&H Cohen's clothing factory on the south side of Glasgow, women who wanted to be sewn machinists would have to spend between nine months and one year in the training school before they were deemed to be qualified enough to work on a sewing machine on the factory floor. In, it, in essence, they were serving an apprenticeship, although the training lacked the formal certification and status given to men who completed apprenticeships as joiners or electricians, for example, in the shipyards on the Upper Clyde. In the stage of downscaling and decline, for male industrial workers, factory closures and plant shutdowns are interpreted as seismic life events which are often traumatic and have long-lasting, life-altering consequences. Yet, there still seems to be an assumption that redundancy is not experienced so deeply by women because of a deep-seated patriarchal view that work is not as important, it's not as a meaningful component of a woman's identity. To mainstream gender into deindustrialization studies, it must be recognised that industrial work was and is a central component of working class women's lives. It was not only a task that they performed to earn a wage, it was a deeper, more meaningful aspect of their identity, which was central to their sense of self. The narratives of women who experienced redundancy in Glasgow when the textile industry came into decline illuminate the critical importance of their working lives to their identity. These are narratives of catastrophe and devastation and reflect a sense of loss following a factory closure. Kathleen Wisner, who worked at the D&H Cohen's clothing factory in Glasgow stated, the place was just empty of this hub of activity in people. It was very, very sad. Yes, girls were crying, they were distraught, Absolutely. It was the end. Well, I suppose we felt it was the end. It was just at Christmas time, wasn't it? It was sad, dreadful. I think people were just in shock, to be honest. Catherine Johnson, who was made redundant from Templeton's carpet, recalled, you actually felt like your world had ended. And it was, what are you going to do now? Because in my life, that had been my life, really, since I was 17. I grew, grew up in there. I knew all the people. It was, you know, you just can't explain it. It was like a death, an unexpected death in the family. You know, like you're just so, you were lost. We were all greeting, crying, going out. In the context of Scotland, in the popular imagination, deindustrialization is associated with the decline of the staple male-dominated heavy industries, most prominently coal mining, shipbuilding, and the steelworks. The decline of these industries is coloured often by high-profile episodes and the politically charged environment in which they occurred, such as the, the Ravens Craig cooling towers at the, the steelworks or, or, or the miners' strike. However, the industrialization in the textile industry lacks that iconography associated with the male-dominated heavy industries. Often it was a hidden industry, hidden within cities, hidden within industrial estates, hidden within modern factory warehouses that were indistinguishable from other industrial units. Yet in older textile communities, the most visible symbols of the industry are still present. The Victorian era mills, such as the Anchor Mill and the Mile End Thread Mills in Paisley in the west of Scotland. However, their renovation to high-end luxury apart apartments is historically insens insensitive, failing in any way to represent the experience of deindustrialization, which affected tens of thousands of workers, predominantly women, during the protracted downscaling of the industry and the company Coates Viella between the mid-1970s and the early 1990s. To conclude, I think we all agree that there is a need for a reorientation of the dominant male-centered narrative of deindustrialization 
to ensure that it becomes sufficiently gender sensitive and inclusive, providing a nuanced representation of the diversity of working class people who were engaged in industrial labour and profoundly affected by the long term legacies of deindustrialization throughout the 20th century. Thanks. Thank you, Rory. Uh, beautiful presentation. Um, some lovely uh, extracts from the interviews. Uh, we move on next to Lauren Laframbois. Lauren is the Associate Director of Deindustrialization and the Politics of Our Time. Um, she recently completed her MA at the Centre for Oral History and Digital Storytelling um, in the Department of History at Concordia at University. Uh, Lauren's work focuses on deindustrialization in the apparel manufacturing industry in Montreal, with particular attention to the intersections of social reproduction, immigration, and resistance in traditionally uh, gendered industrial work. Over to you, Lauren. Oh, where is Lauren? You there, Lauren? Okay, cool. <laughs> Good stuff. Sorry, I'm just managing two different computers at the same time and it's a little bit confusing, so <laughs> forgive me. Um, I'm just going to share my screen one moment, please. Um, can everybody see that? Oh, no. Sorry, just a second. Okay, there we go. I think we're we're good to go. So, um, hi everyone, and thanks to Naomi and Rory for their um, fantastic presentations. Um, my presentation is really going to be on the same theme of the garment industry, uh, but this time in Montreal. Um, I'll be looking at the ways that the women's movement in the 1970s and 1980s intersected um, with uh, women's resistance to deindustrialization. So in the first half, oops, in the first half of the 20th century, um, the garment industry was huge in Montreal and accounted for one in four manufacturing jobs. Um, between 1976 and 1996, 27,000 jobs were lost in the textile industry. Yes, oh, yeah. okay, yeah. sorry guys, a little bit of technical issues here, um, but I think that it's good. Um, so as employers sought to cut costs, um, they primarily laid off their sewing machine operators, um, who were, you know, the first to be laid off in uh, a deindustrializing factory. And in 1986, um, 94% of sewing machine operators were born outside of Canada. Um, at the same time as trade liberalization slashed employment in Montreal's highly feminized labor uh, intensive industries. Um, second wave feminism in Canada and Quebec made its way into the labor movement. In union circles, the industrial unions and their federations began forming um, their own women's committees. Um, and trade union feminism at this time really focused on eliminating gendered wage gaps in collective agreements, um, advocating for paid maternity leave and increased access to abortion. Um, so the histories of the garment industry and the feminist movement intersected frequently at this time with women's organizations and publications um, frequently attempting to draw attention to the poor working conditions in the industry um, and the failures of the garment unions to protect their workers. Um, at this time, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union executive was largely dominated by male workers who came um, from the highest paid segments of the workforce. So even though much of the early union organizing had been carried out by women like Rose Pizzotta and Leah Roback, their work was largely discredited from within the union. Um, tellingly, between 1910 and 1987, no woman had ever occupied um, an executive position within the union. Um, a combination of legislation and union strategy also meant that 
much of the decision making happened very far from the shop floor where women had at least a minimal political voice. From the perspectives of the women who organized in the garment industry, um, the union had also long lost any sense of um, militancy. On the forefront of the rank and file movement to breathe militancy back into the union was the Garment Workers Action Committee, which was formed in 1980 by a multiracial and multi-ethnic coalition of sewing machine operators. Um, and they were dissatisfied largely with the inaction of their union in the face of mass closures and job losses. The Action Committee organized a secretive network of communication to organize meetings and settled on a strategy to take their union into their own hands. Um, its assessment of the ILGWU um, was scathing. It accused it of having an anti-democratic structure um, and it forced effectively its members to defend themselves. They affirmed that it is only workers organized at the base that can um, win victories against their employers. And that's a quote. Um, on November 4th, 1981, the Action Committee published the Dossier Noir sur l'UOVD, or the Black Book on the ILGWU, which was a scathing report against the union's corruption, its leadership, and the plight of workers in an industry operating under the constant threat of deindustrialization. The Black Book was distri distributed um, to garment workers, labor organizers, and other community activists. Gendered concerns about health and safety um, were really at the core of the Black Book. The very first section um, denounced the way that the collective agreement characterized pregnancy as an illness, and in many women's experiences, pregnancy would also lead to job loss. Another concern for the Dossier Noir um, was their, for their aging workers, so um, restrictive conditions to access their pensions meant that few were able to accumulate the um, required consecutive years of service. Um, the Black Book argued that women's paid work periods were often um, interrupted by leaves of absence to perform the gendered and unpaid labor of childcare and other types of caregiving. And within the context of deindustrialization, Frequent plant closures also thwarted women's ability to um, accumulate consecutive years of service that were required to access the pensions. Um, so through this very brief um, window into my research, uh, we can see that the Black Book and the Action Committee's other organizing um, shows the ways that feminist movements inflected organizing against closures. And so if we're going to truly gender our understanding of deindustrialization studies, we need to go beyond just increasing the representation of women's experiences within the existing paradigms of the field and pay attention to how gender discrimination intersected with the capitalist process and also shaped the pathways of deindustrialization. Um, in addition to that, how other social movements like feminism intersected with um, movements against closures. So that's it from me. Thank you. Mm, thank you, Laura. Um, you might just close your screen there if you could. Uh, Laura, thank you. Thank you. Uh, beautiful presentation, Laura. Many, many thanks. Um, uh, so next up, next up is uh, Rebecca Chatelier. Rebecca is um, a PhD student here at the Scottish Oral History Centre. Uh, Rebecca's just entering her second year. Um, Rebecca's research is focused on um, deindustrialization uh, of the textile industry in small communities in Scotland uh, and the American South, uh, pivoting around um, Stanley in Perth and Remington in, in Georgia. And it heavily relies on oral testimony. Rebecca was born and raised in New Orleans. Um, she obtained a BA from George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, and her master's um, in, uh, of liberal arts, uh, which focused on modern history and ancient philosophy from Tulane University in New Orleans. Rebecca, over to you. Hello, thank you. And um, 
great presentations before me. Um, <laughs> I, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right, I hope that works for everyone. I want to see that. Now, there we go, sorry. Um, as, as, my, as Arthur said uh, in my introduction, I am focused on two single industry towns that were built around the cotton mill industry and the cotton mill specifically. And I was lucky enough to get into the archives this, this past summer, which of course has not been open due, due to COVID-19. And so for my time, I'd like to specifically look at a few things that I found in the archives that I'm still sort of working through as part of my research. And while I was in the archives, the Perth and Kinross archives, I did make a little cycling journey of about seven miles up a very steep hill to the village of Stanley. And that's the photo that I took of, of the current site today. So the Stanley mills have been turned into a heritage site. That justification for turning it into a heritage site as opposed to demolition was that it is one of the original Arkwright villages. Uh, Sir Richard Arkwright is the inventor of the spinning jenny and also was highly um, a high influencer of the UNESCO heritage site of New Lanark. So therefore there was a preservation underway and this is now a heritage site that I've yet to be able to visit because it's not been opened since COVID-19. Um, but it has also been turned into high-end lofts for the, for the less um, desirable building or less um, historical buildings as they justified them. However, when it came to turning this into a heritage site, the names that kept popping up in the justification was only based on the fact that they were architectural heritage of the Industrial Revolution. And there was not much spoken about the actual workers who worked in these sites. So as I was going through uh, the archives, I came across this wonderful advertisement for, for workers that dates October 28th, 1967. And I know you probably can't read the, the writing, so I'm going to go ahead and, and read it for you because I thought it was fantastic. It states, Stanley Mills has a way with women and women have a way of giving Stanley Mills something very special. At Stanley Mills in the tape unit, we make tapes used in cigarette making machines. It is a precision job. It demands the deafness and care that only a woman can give. It's a job that really uses the very special touch of a woman's fingers. At Stanley Mills, we value precision and accuracy, but we promise you steady, reliable work. Stanley Mills already looks after 80 girls, pays them an average wage of 11 pounds, 40 hour week, but there's more than money involved. Stanley Mills girls are transported to and from work and work is on the banks of the Tay in a clean, freshly decorated factory where 1967 facilities fit into a setting where textile traditions go back nearly 200 years. Stanley Mill girls do clean work in modern surroundings and they can lunch every day in the canteen. Sounds like a job for you. I found this a, a rather striking advertisement. For one, they are wooing women or at least it's feels as if they, they are wooing women to, to work in Stanley. But also, as they are bringing them up and saying that they are, their skills are needed, they also are bringing them down and, and referencing them as girls or someone who needs to be taken care of. What is clear is that this factory and this community that was built to surround the factory and house these women were reliant on these women workers. Now, As we move ahead, just a few years, I came across as well a number of pamphlets that were written by owners and investors in the textile industry in Scotland who were concerned about opening up to the European economic community, which of course would be, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm now forgetting. All, all I'm thinking of is Brexit right now, but the, the EU, there we go, the European Union. Sorry for that little mind blown. Uh, and 
as you'll notice in this text uh, that were that was sent to to members of the parliament in justification of keeping the mills going and keeping foreign products out of the country as they're justifying how important the textile industry is to Scotland as a foundation for the work of Scotland. It states that the industry employs nearly a million people, 12% of the British manufacturing industry labor force, fourth in league of, the, of export performance. So with it in mind that this was dated 1969, 70, 71, 72, just a few years after the advertisement, this is a significant portion of the work of the industrial workforce of Britain. Therefore, women were a significant portion of the industrial workforce and have their place in deindustrialized uh, study. Now, when the mills did close in the 1989, it was a significant loss. It was argued in this particular newspaper ar article that it would not be a significant loss to the economy, that the city of Stanley had moved on at that point, and it was sad that 200 years of, of, of mills were closing, but it very, at the end, makes the point that this was a capital intensive system which would be operated by a staff of 30 members and 26 of whom of the present 40 54 strong staff were already working their notice. So it's it's making it very clear that it's unimportant, that the closure of the mill was unimportant and that as it scaled down with only 26 people left, it wouldn't be a very important loss to the community, which of course I wouldn't agree with. <laughs> now, when it comes to the restoration of, of the mill, there is a little blurb when it's talking about the restoration. Of course, most of it is focused on the men who began the site, but it states that it's important because it is significant to the industrial development of the entire country. However, it also states that 800 people at its height, mainly women and children, worked there. And therefore, I would argue that women were at the heart of the industrial revolution in Scotland, just and therefore are justified in their place in the deindustrialize in the deindustrialization of the country as well. Thank you for your time. And I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up and I'm welcome any questions about these little snippets I found in the archives. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, wonderful presentation. Um, uh, we move on to um, Marian Ori. Uh, Marian is uh, a PhD student um, under a, a joint supervision, a co tutel agreement between ourselves at the Scottish Oral History Centre and uh, Science Po in, in, in Paris. Marian's research uh, focuses, focuses on the history of brass bands in the British uh, coal fields from 1947. Um, and 1981 or so. She studied in France uh, for her undergraduate and um, postgrad degrees and graduated with a master's in history at Sciences Po in 2013. Marion, over to you. You're on mute, Marion. Sorry, thank you, uh, Arthur, for the presentation. And uh, thank you for uh, the thank you to the organizer, and thank you for great presentations. Uh, so I'm going to present um, a few elements uh, on my PhD research on mining uh, brass bands um, uh, linked to the coal industry, which uh, will show how cultural activities can be a valuable lens to analyze the evolution of gender relations in working class areas in a context of the industrialization, and which will also show how the memorialization 
of uh, the industry, which is a gendered process, as we saw, has downplayed uh, not only the role of women in industrial employment and the impact of the industrialization on women, but also the role of women in working class cultures. Um, because when I started my research on mining brass bands, uh, at first I did not see women, uh, and this is understandable. You can have a look here at this picture of the early miner, miners' welfare brass bands in the early 1950s. So brass bands are amateur musical formations composed of uh, from uh, 24 to 25 brass instruments with percussions. And their instrumentation, repertoire and culture has been shaped by competition. So brass bands would con compete in contests uh, and be ranked in different sections, uh, a bit like uh, football, for instance. Uh, and they emerged from the mid 19th century and were encouraged by the idea of rational recreation, which was spread by middle class industrialists during the Victorian period. As you can see on the photograph, women were generally excluded from mining brass bands. This can be explained obviously by the strong gendering of, lab of heavy industries and especially coal mining. Um, even though women worked in the coal industry, in the surface, in the offices and in the canteens. Uh, you, you've got a quote here of Robert Lowe, who was a brass band uh, player, who internalized this idea that coal mining was a man's thing. And he's explaining the absence of women in brass bands by saying, I think it's just because they didn't work in the pits. There were no female working at the pits underground, so it's all men, and that's how it was. It's a man's thing. Uh, we can also add that according to the model of the separate spheres, uh, leisure was stopped as a reward for paid labor, labor and consequently leisures outside the home uh, were provided mostly to men and contributed to shape working class uh, masculinity according to a negotiations between respectability and roughness. We can also add an element of cultural representation with the idea that playing wind instruments was regarded as inappropriate and disgraceful for women. However, between the uh, early 60s and the early 80s, women became more and more numerous in mining brass bands, which shows that we have a gendered memory of working class cultures. Uh, this was a long term process because it actually started during the interwar years, uh, but this truly accelerated from the 1960s onward, with more and more women and young girls present in uh, mining brass bands. You've got two examples here, the case of four uh, women players in Hatfield Main Colliery Band in Yorkshire, uh, presented here as mother because they uh, all gave birth almost at the same time. And you have also the example of Sherlin Miners Welfare Band in Derbyshire, where almost a third of the membership of the band at the front of the picture here uh, is composed of eight women instrumentalists. Um, so you, we can see that the industrialization had an impact on a gender relation outside the sphere of work and that women were actually essential to uh, sustain uh, brass bands as a cultural activities in the coal field until the early 80s. Uh, because actually, if this acceleration of feminization can be explained by several processes, it can be linked to the fact that from the 60s, um, there was a marginalization of brass bands in popular culture and also uh, deindustrialization, which created recruitment issues uh, for brass bands. So uh, you can see here uh, in this um, interview conducted by, with Pat Wafferty, John McAtee and Tom, Tom Canavan in Croy uh, in Lanarkshire, uh, how they resort to the lexical network of necessity to explain how uh, they resorted to women from the 1980s onward in Croy Silver, Silver Band uh, saying uh, they suddenly decided 
how we're going to get players and somebody decided why not try lassies girls uh, so you can you can see this this element of necessities here um, however this feminization was still constrained by um, uh, gendered norms and values and by horizontal and vertical segregation as they were generally excluded from the top bands and as there was sustained chauvin chauvinism and traditional conception of masculinities um, in these bands and especially in the top bands um, so this hence at the idea that uh, this uh, tenacity of work, traditional conception of working class masculinities can both be interpreted as a form of uh, tenacity, but also as a reaction to uh, a declining uh, position uh, and a status in the sphere of employment. Um, and you've got, uh, this is particularly visible in the case of top colliery bands. You've got here the example of Carlton Main Frickley Colliery Band and an anecdote told by Ray Sykes explaining how women were uh, excluded not only from the band but also from the band bus to go to competitions and to concerts. So to conclude, I just wanted to show in this presentation how cultural activities are a lens to analyze the impact of the industrialization uh, outside the sphere of work and how leisure activities were a central element to sustain and shape masculine working class identities uh, in the face of the industrialization, uh, which also led to a gendered memorialization of working class cultures. Thank you very much. Thanks, Marianne. Many thanks uh, for a lovely presentation. And my apologies for my alarm going off <laughs> at the, uh, the crucial six minute point. Uh, thank you, Marianne. Uh, next presentation uh, Next presentation is by Amber Ward. Uh, Amber is an AHRC funded PhD student in the Department of History at the University of St Andrews um, here in Scotland. Um, she's jointly supervised by Dr Mal Malcolm Petrie, Professor Jim Phillips and Dr Ewan Gibbs. Uh, her work investigates community identity and consciousness in five ex-mining communities in the aftermath of the miners' strike of 1984-1985. Uh, her work examines the cultural resonances of economic change and pays particular attention to the experiences of ethnic, racial and LGBT plus uh, communities. Over to you, Amber. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Let me know if you can see that. Great. So hi, everyone. And um, thanks so much for having me here to talk about my research today. Um, as Arthur has just mentioned, I'm Amber and I'm just going into the second year of my PhD in history at St Andrews in Fife in Scotland. And my PhD research investigates community identity and economic change in the ex-mining communities of Central Fife after 1985. So just to give you a quick introduction to my project. Fife is a semi-rural county on the east coast of the Scottish Lowlands. It's a peninsula located between the urban locales of Dundee in the north and Edinburgh in the south, which you can see a bit better here. And the part of Fife that I'm interested in, the central region, was subject to late, rapid and highly concentrated industrialization at the turn of the 20th century, primarily in the textile and coal industries. And here you can see a few photos from one colliery in the area at this time, the Michael, and another of several modern super pits sunk in the area during the post-war years. The vast majority of these pits closed down throughout the 1960s and the 1970s. These closures were mediated by moral economy negotiations between unions and officials so that redundant miners were offered employment in an alternative sector, such as assembly line work. However, by the onset of the Thatcher Premiership in the 1980s, these customs were abandoned, with many ex-miners and factory workers in the area simply left redundant. 
Since the 1980s, poverty and unemployment in central Fife has skyrocketed. In 2020, the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation, or the SIMD, ranked a small area of central Fife as the most deprived ex-mining locality in Scotland and the fifth most deprived locality in Scotland overall. And this is central Fife outlined here on the SIMD map. Um, blue indicates low deprivation here and red indicates high deprivation. And it's essentially this last period that my research wants to learn more about. The period after the minor strike of 84 to 85 and after deindustrialization proper through to the present day. My project is very much inspired by recent deindustrialization studies. Scholars including Jim Tomlinson, Jim Phillips, Valerie Wright and Ewan Gibbs have made pioneering and invaluable contributions to our understanding of post-war deindustrialization in a Scottish context. And here's an example of that in Fife. Each of these scholars have also considered how these structural shifts relate to changes in what we might call culture in the broadest sense of the term. This includes changes in things like social life and political activity, but also more subtle changes to things like how we identify, how we see our place in the world, and even our notion of what is and what isn't common sense. And so following the lead of these scholars, I'm also interested to learn how culture has evolved, but specifically in the aftermath of deindustrialization and under successive premierships, which undertook projects of neoliberal restructuring. I'm also interested to investigate if different social groupings within a coalfield community hold different accounts of recent, uh, recent cultural change. And so the way that I hope to gain some of these insights is to approach the Central Fife Coalfield in these years through the lens of community. And I've tried to interpret the category of community in as many ways as I can. So I plan to hold some oral history discussion sessions with the following community groups, which pivot around the theme of how our lives and communities have changed since the 1980s. And as you can see from the list, I'm not explicitly engaging with gender as a category of community in itself. However, what I'm ultimately looking at is the relationship between fluctuations in culture and shifts within the capitalist mode of production, the latter of which depends upon the gender division of labor, both paid and unpaid, to sustain. And so gender remains absolutely central to my project as a whole, and it does so in several different ways. Firstly, I think it's significant that these community groups undertake social work, which is often gendered as female. For instance, many run social gatherings which provide food or education, or which might facilitate, and I say this in inverted commas, gossip. The groups might also offer childcare, informal therapy, physical care, and support and activities for young people. And it'll be interesting to see how different individuals both within and between the different groups, articulate the place of these activities within their wider community, and if they do so within a gendered framework. I'm also interested to know if they feel that the nature and purpose of these activities have changed over time, possibly in line with broader shifts in the economy, such as occupational transitions, high unemployment, and changing employment opportunities. I think it's also significant that I'm inquiring into memories of a time when an awareness of the social constructedness of gender came into popular usage and consciousness. And so I think it'll be interesting to see if and how participants themselves engage in a, a gendered critique of their own past, perhaps through concepts and lenses such as masculinity, patriarchy, and different strands of feminism. Following in this vein, I'm also very much looking forward to hearing how members of Fife Pride, the local LGBT plus group, articulate their experiences of recent historic change. The group organise events and festivals which celebrate queer identities, including gender nonconformity. And so I hope that what participants have to say might tell us a lot about the reconfiguration of gendered roles, norms and ideas which accompany neoliberal restructuring 
within a deindustrialized coal field context. I hope that these insights can make even a small contribution to future regeneration and socialist strategies, ones which go beyond the hollow monolithic narratives of coal field communities as parochial insular locales, ones which have simply been left behind in recent years. So thanks for your time today. I look forward to any questions at the end. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Amber. Um, splendid presentation. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, uh, last but not least, folks, we have uh, Andy Clark. Um, Andy Clark is uh, an oral historian uh, with interests in labour history, deindustrialization, ruination, and the impacts of multiple deprivation. Um, Andy completed his PhD here at the uh, Scottish Oral History Centre um, back in. Is it, is it 2017? Didn't seem that long ago, Andy. Uh, <laughs> subsequently, <laughs> Andy subsequently worked at the universities of Stirling and Newcastle, um, and he's presently based at the Oral History uh, uh, Unit or Oral History Collective at Newcastle University. Uh, Andy's con conducted research and published uh, widely on the response of women workers to factory closure in Scotland, framed within an analysis of short and long-term impacts of capital relocation on mobilization theories and memories of activism. Uh, Andy has a contract uh, for a monograph based on his work. So uh, do look out folks for his forthcoming book on um, women and the factory occupations in Scotland in the uh, early 1980s. Over to you, Andy. Thanks very much, Arthur. I'm just going to set my stopwatch so that I don't go on far too long, as I'm prone to do. No, thanks very much, everyone. It's, it's a real pleasure to, to bookend this, this session um, with some fantastic papers uh, beforehand. As, as Arthur said, I'm going to talk today about the research that contributes to my book that will hopefully be published next year. I thought it would be really easy to write a book during lockdown, but it turned out to be much more difficult than if the world had stayed normal. Um, but... What I want to touch on in, in relation to this theme is the really the, the aspects of gender that came out um, across my research. So the research that I conducted with Arthur at the Scottish Oral History Centre focused on three workforces in Scotland, predominantly female workforces who seized control of their factories when faced with unfair closure between February 1981 and March 1982. Now these closures were driven by large multinational corporations seeking to reduce their labour costs and relocate sites of production to lower cost economies. Now, what's really fascinating about these occupations is that all three of them to varying degrees were successful. All three factories remained open. And I argue and have and will continue to argue that this is one of, if not the most significant period in the history of British working class resistance to deindustrialization, but it's not part of current academic or popular discourse of the period. I want to talk about two aspects of the research. The first is the dialogue that I, I've tried to open with industrial relations scholarship on how we understand worker mobilization. And the second aspect returns us to memory and how we think about the gendering of deindustrialization in memory, misremembering and forgetting. In terms of mobilization, I'm really interested in how we understand the process through which a group of individual actors take the decision to act as a collective. In, in thinking about that, I've been doing a lot of work with um, John Kelly's um, seminal mobilization thesis that he released and published in 1998. And he argued that to understand mobilization and collective response of workers, you have to look at two key aspects. The first being morally indefensible injustice, and the second being strong workplace leadership. These are required in order to allow for the development of a collective consciousness leading to class action. But what's curious in, in this um, study and what mobilization theory doesn't account for is that occupation and militant resistance to closure was very much the exception to the process of deindustrialization. A shockingly low number of workforces actively resisted the process of closure. So this injustice doesn't seem to fully encapsulate the experience that took place. Rather, I've developed the argument that the collective identity on the factory floor developed before closure 
through, as Jackie Clark talks about, the inter in work interaction as women and as workers on the shop floor. Following the closure decision, not only was it the process of what was happening in the factory that led to militant resistance, but the social and economic climate of deindustrialization fueled the injustice of the workers and sparked the anger. It was very much a case of if we don't fight, the future is incredibly bleak. And that for me explains why we have this situation not previously seen of three female workforces taking this action in a relatively short period of time. And I argue for the importance of repositioning the industrial workplace as a site for investigation in our research, particularly when trying to understand the gendering of deindustrialization. The second aspect that I just want to touch upon is the way in which the memory of deindustrialization has been gendered in this case study and hopefully open it up to international comparisons and conversation. In the UK in particular, the memory and popular discourse of deindustrialization is fundamentally masculine. It is a narrative overall of defeat for organized labor, challenged masculinity, and the bogeywomen of Thatcher wreaking misery on working class communities. And these are just a few examples of where we can see that, both in film, television, and also in memorials and monuments to industry, such as shipbuilding on the Clyde and coal mining in Lanarkshire. But what does this impact on those women who were involved in activism and militantly opposing factory closure at the time? Paula Hamilton has demonstrated that in order for memories to survive, they must have sites for reinforcement and remembering so that they can thrive over time rather than become submerged be, um, below and beyond public and popular discourse. In this research, what really emerged with the extreme masculinity of memory of deindustrialization is it impacted individual remembering in ways that I couldn't understand at first. It took a long time for me to kind of grapple with and it's quite difficult for me to explain in, in this short form presentation, but I will, I have written about it more extensively. The first aspect is the insignificance and self marginalization amongst the women themselves who were involved. This revealed itself firstly, and Arthur will remember these panic conversations and challenges of recruiting the women who occupied the factories to take part in oral history interviews. The constant response was, I didn't do anything significant. All I did was occupy a factory. And this then came out in the interviews themselves. A constant theme was that we weren't like the miners, we weren't like the shipbuilders, we weren't militant, we had nothing to be celebrated. All we were was a group of women sitting in a factory. And this was really interesting when you counterpoise it in narratives of men who took part in industrial dispute during the time. And this played out particularly at the individual level in misremembering and forgetting from the national to the local. Now, these three factory occupations were not part of a coordinated campaign. However, they took place over a short period of time and across a very small geographical area. In 1982, these occupations were spoke about collectively. Thank you, Arthur. They were talked about as, as being interlinked, as inspiring and taking heed from one another. By 2015, when I conducted the oral history interviews, all of those who were involved had no recollection of the other disputes that had taken place. There had been no way for their memory to tie into popular sites of memory in order to tie their local action to the broader economic process at the time. There is no popular discourse for memory and sites of memory to survive. For the women in 2015, their action had been reduced to a single plant occupation rather than being part of the broader process of class resistance in Scotland. And just to wrap up, the, the best example I can find of this, in, in this image we have two of the shop stewards who were involved in these occupations, and one of them is Helen Monaghan, who's this lady here, has no recollection of this occupation having ever taken place because she was a leader of a different one. Memory is fundamentally shaped by gender and popular narratives and discourses of deindustrialization as being masculine events. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks a so million, Andy. Um, wonderful presentation. Um, 
Uh, okay, we're moving to uh, we're moving to discussion and questions, uh, folks. Um, and if I could start in the chat, um, I think the first question is from from Stephen. Um, Stephen, do you want to um, <clears throat> do you want to introduce this, or do you want me to read out from chat? I was just struck with the first two presentations, which were excellent. Uh, one was speaking about the centrality of women's work and the memory of that. And the other was the erasure. And uh, I'm wondering why they played out in those very different ways um, in those in Derry and, and Glasgow. Um, well, I'll just kind of talk obviously about, about the, the dairy side of things. Um, we, all, we often joke about the fact that dairy women are the bosses <laughs> when it comes to uh, just in general life. There's um, at one point there was actually um, a, a governmental paper that uh, stated that dairy uh, around that time was turning into almost a, an embryo matriarchy in the sense of, you know, the sort of fundamental ideas of male breadwinners and heads of households was kind of uh, slightly being eroded. Um, but really it was, you know, it was a combination. Um, it was a combination of high male unemployment and the fact that we actually had a lot of shirt factories at the time. So it's it's really, it's, it's something that's cultural um, with regards to, you know, the, the narrative in general. Um, a lot of the men will quite happily place the women in the forefront of, of the sort of discussions and especially when they're remembering the factories and it's not seen as, as something that the challenges maybe their perceived gender role in society or anything it's it's certainly just kind of the the way it is um and it's not really something that's that's confrontational or or seen as um problematic in any way um but obviously the you know the, the Glasgow side of things is as quite different um, to the, the dairy experience. Uh, yeah, I, that, that it was quite striking actually, the, the stark difference. I mean, my, my, my sense is that in Glasgow, shipbuilding was so sort of hegemonic and, and dominant and so symbolic of, of Glasgow that that was seen as being sort of the industry, the prime industry. And there was such a connection, obviously, between masculinity and, and shipbuilding in Glasgow that I, I think that women's work in the textile industry was just so sort of devalued in a, in a cultural sense and how people and people's conceptions of work and industrial work. And over time, I, I think it's essentially been lost, that textile history, because it was always so low ranking and so substandard in people's minds compared to the, the more dominant uh, industries in Glasgow, as I say, particularly uh, shipbuilding. Uh, I also think there's a kind of longer term tra trajectory that's, that's linked to that as well of Glasgow having this real uh, macho, masculine, uh, sort of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not depiction, but uh, sort of identity that it, it was viewed viewed as a the hard set you know hard man hard city uh, in the, the book no mean city but the razor gangs in glasgow in the 30s city with high levels of unemployment it was seen that to survive you were a hard man and masculinity almost became symbolic with, with glasgow's identity so again that subversion of, of of women's experiences women's identities even within that kind of broader conception of uh, the city uh, and, and just as Another example in, in the kind of main uh, social history museum, although I'm not sure it's actually still opened, I think there was a dispute over funding, it's maybe open part time now in Glasgow, the, the People's Palace, it's located uh, a couple of hundred yards or, or less away from uh, a major or former major a carpet factory in Glasgow, which the, the Templeton carpet factory where the building has still been retained and it's been uh, remodified as flats and a pub and a restaurant and, and the likes. But in the People's Palace where the windows actually face on to this old carpet factory, a, a little bit like uh, Rebecca was speaking about, that there is a little bit about the carpet factory, but it's mainly focused on um, sort of early or early mid 19th century stuff, 
like a really, really old looms uh, and a couple of pictures or, or artistic drawings of the of the factory from sort of around 1850. But there's really nothing about the process of deindustrialization, women's engagement with, with the, the labor process in the factory. So even within the sort of main social history uh, institution in Glasgow, women's experiences of industrial work, which is literally 100 yards away or so, is, is totally kind of missing from that wider narrative. Uh, I was really struck, and I didn't have time to include it in my presentation, but one of the women I interviewed was speaking actually about how she was sad that she felt that the textile industry in, Gla in Glasgow had been completely forgotten. Um, and she, she was saying about how her children only know about it, she feels, because she's told them about it. And she said, they're, they're, they're sort of fed up of hearing about it from me. But she was like quite sad about the fact that people of her children's generation, because a lot of it's just been totally destroyed, or as I say, they were in quite indistinguishable buildings and sort of work, uh, warehouses and workshops that it was never prominent and kind of lacked that iconography. Um, and, and yeah, so I, I think, I hope that kind of answers it, but I just think it's it's been lost within uh, Glasgow's sort of wider narrative. Thanks, uh, Naomi. Thanks, Rory. Um, next uh, comment from uh, in the chat is from Amri Jeanette. Amri, you still here? I just flicked along and I couldn't see Amri. Amri, would you mind, folks, if we just uh, uh, maybe come back to this uh, towards the end? Amri's comment is. Um, I'm interested in also learning more about the experience of women, especially working class women, in the rise of the service sector of the economy, not just the decline of the manufacturing sector. So maybe we'll come back to that if we have time um, towards the end. Next question is from Fred. Fred, do you want to come in on this? Oh, Fred, you, you are there. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, no, I, I think it's okay. It was more about a, it was more a way to go, Lauren. That's a great point than a question. So we can pass on to someone else. Okay, Fred, good stuff. Um, Arthur, maybe we can move on to uh, Stefan Berger has his hand up. Oh, okay. Do you want to come back to the, the chat stuff afterwards? Go on, uh, Stefan. Thanks, Arthur, and many thanks for a great set of papers. Uh, really enjoyed uh, every one. And I think what comes out very strongly for me is this sort of uh, incredible gendering of the process of deindustrialization. Um, and at the same time, the, um, the lack of memorialization uh, of that gendering. I mean, that, that I guess was something that connected almost all of the papers. Um, and I was wondering whether you could say a little bit about uh, the political impact of that. Uh, whilst I was listening to you, I remembered a study, I think in the, already in the 90s, uh, looking at uh, voting in Britain uh, and showing a clear decline of women voting for the Labour Party in Britain between the mid-1970s and the end-1980s. Um, now, um, the fact that sort of uh, women um, in a way were not remembered in deindustrialization um, sort of, um, did, I mean, it's just a speculation, but I mean, could it be the fact that, you know, I mean, all of this kind of anti-Thatcher mode came from kind of muscular male steel workers, miners and shipyard workers. Um, so, you know, women sort of probably didn't feel particularly involved uh, in that, or I, I mean, I don't know, but uh, I was wondering because very few of the papers talked about politics, whether, whether someone could bring in the political implication uh, of this uh, massive gendering of the industrialization. Any of the speakers like to comment on that? Um, do you want to me me and... Sorry. Mm -hmm. All right, on, on you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Northern Irish uh, context, um, particularly in the time period that, you know, more towards the sort of 60s, 70s and, and beyond, the complexities of the political system 
um, are so sort of so removed from the, the sort of main British kind of system. Um, you know, when it comes to the, the political um, the political movements in the city, um, particularly surrounding housing, civil rights, um, but more so sort of, you know, the, the male unemployment, it was largely women who were actively engaged in campaigning, organizing marches um, from some of the shared, shared factories. They actually, the whole floor just got up and left on a march um, because they could. Um, they felt safe enough to do that. Um, so there was a huge political engagement um, at a grassroots level, but certainly when it comes to, you know, the sort of uh, engagement with local government, um, the, the storm of government when it was there and the um, even, you know, awareness of the UK uh, political system, it was still seen very much as a male domain. Um, but the, the grassroots in Derry in particular was very much um, sort of run and very much uh, kept going by the, the activism and small scale activism of women. Um, but do you want to come in next? Yeah, uh, just a quick comment. Um, just thinking about how women have been left out of sort of industrial commemorations by and large. And I think it's something that I've thought about before. And I think that possibly the political, the post-industrial political frame that women have to understand their own struggle and their own plight isn't sort of located in the past, like a lot of in masculine industrial heritages, but it's sort of been framed by politicians in terms of sort of liberal feminism, that your struggle is now, your struggle is in the workplace against your boss. And you as an individual can rally against that in order to have a successful career or um, you can have a home and a, a, a wonderful family. And so I think that the, the understandings of struggle of, of where the suffering is for men and women, and this is, I'm speaking very broadly and very generally, um, I, I think um, possibly for male sectors of society located more in the past, whereas women, it's kind of a political terrain that a lot of I think political parties are sort of capitalizing on just now and so then the debate is over well who can sell that to women better is it the conservatives is it labor is it others um and so yes that's just so something that i've thought about before and um, so that's that. mm, thanks amber R rory you're next then andy <laughs> hey, that was, yeah i think amber's point is a uh, really really pertinent really really important uh, i was just thinking a little bit around Brexit and the framing of who actually is the working class in Britain, because whenever you see these little vox pop pieces on the news or anything like that, when they talk about going to industrial communities in the north or deindustrialized communities in the north to speak to them about their views on Brexit, it is inevitably a white male who's over 65. And I think it just speaks to a wider point, uh, Stefan, about the, the, the erasure of, of Yes, women, but and also people of colour from from the British working class and um, within that wider political settlement. Because I, I do think when we speak about Brexit and, and British uh, media, there's a, this easy, lazy line often used by the news around uh, deindustrialised communities voted overwhelmingly for Brexit. I don't have the statistics to to support that, but there is no sort of uh, consideration for. Uh, women industrial workers, they never go to a, a former a textile area and interview 10, 15 women that worked in a textile factory. It is always old white men they interview, that, and that seems to be the, the that dominant hegemonic sort of construction of what is the British working class, and it excludes women, and it excludes people of colour. Andy? Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in and I think I noticed Steve had kind of said in the chat what I was going to touch on in terms of the kind of liberation of women post-post um, deindustrialization. I think politically one of the most interesting dynamics of that has been particularly in the UK and I apologise that I'm not as familiar with the European and North American context but it's been the feminization of the labour movement um, particularly in Britain so for the last few years 
for the first time ever, women have been proportionally more unionised than men. The labour movement has been proportionally um, more female than at any other point in its history. Two of the the most two of the largest unions in Britain, UCU, which is our union, and then Unite as well, now have female general secretaries. Um, the, the, and the, the, the general secretary of the TUC as well is also female. So it's interesting that the commemoration and, the, and discussion around trade unionism is a very historic masculine thing, and that continues. Whereas a contemporary situation of workplace politics is very much um, becoming more feminised. I think another aspect that relates to politics, as, as Stefan was saying, that's something that I, I write about, but I didn't have time to discuss it there, is that the political discussion around reindustrialization and the industrial economy moving forward continues to focus disproportionately and overwhelmingly on those industries where men dominate. In, in, the, in the Scottish context, it's shipbuilding. In the English context, it's car manufacturing. Those remain the case, seen as the great industrial industries rather than thinking about the way in which um, the shift to the renewable sector could feminise that workforce and think about industrialisation in different ways, something that Ewan Gibbs is currently working on as well. And just to kind of back on to what Rory was saying there, I think it is interesting that the blame that's attributed to the rise of kind of right-wing populism does consistently focus on those areas of white working class men. As he said, in Britain, it's constantly in former steel towns, mining areas. And I'm always struck by in the North American context, it's always former auto workers who are kind of talked about, why did you vote Trump? Whereas in these communities, there is a large number of um, former industrial workers who are women who may or may not have voted that particular way, but it's a dynamic and a conversation that's not had because of this idea that deindustrialization and the legacy of deindustrialization is fundamentally something that impacts on men. Thanks, Abby. Um, other questions or comments, folks? Alicia, I see, um, I see you asked a question to um, Lauren, oh. I think, in the chat. Has that been answered uh, sufficiently or do you want to come back? I'm on sorry, that? Arthur, just to feed off of um, the previous question. Back. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add to, especially Amber's point um, on the North American side, it is, it is very much a, a now of the, the political structure, whereas what I always find interesting in North America is just as deindustrialization was happening in the um, textile industries in the 1980s, late 1970s, there is this rhetoric of women are suddenly entering the workforce due to second wave feminism and around the 70s and the 80s that they were leaving the home and going into the workforce, but that perspective was all in uh, office place work and not necessarily manufacturing industrial work. And that's where you see a lot of the, the movements, the political and labor movements of uh, like nine to five labor movement growing in North America. So, so I just wanted to add that North American perspective when it comes to women in politics and, and the, the movements that were involved uh, during the time that, that it's very much to back up Amber's point of, of what's in the now politically for women and not that necessarily heritage. Mm, thanks, Rebecca. Um, uh, Alicia, you had a question, I think. Yeah, in the, yeah. In the chat. can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Go, go yeah, because uh, the internet in Germany is low right now. I, <laughs> I'm sorry, so you can't see me. But um, yeah, actually, because we have uh, dissonance and the numbers of uh, unemployed women when we look at textile and garment industry in Germany, because it's even more persons who lost their jobs um, when we compare to the miners in Germany. And that's a fact that is um, somehow um, yeah, not seen because of the um, registration of unemployed, because women often don't uh, register because they can still work from home and be mothers. And yeah, the old paternalistic uh, a narrative is found here. So yeah, we have this dissonance and that's why I wondered if we have maybe the same um, for her studies and if we really can trust the numbers when she says, okay, actually women were uh, um, most of the times in jobs. Hmm. Thanks, uh, Alicia. 
Hello, um, anybody else want to come back on that? In the panel? Just to, no, no, me. Yeah, just to speak about, um, you know, the dairy example. When it came to um, levels of male unemployment, it's something that, particularly in the oral history, it's not something that the, the women want to dwell on too much. Um, there has been a real sort of conscious effort on their behalf to kind of say, well, look, male unemployment, it was really high. Nobody could get a job then. No man, you know, it was almost excusing the fact that they were in the workplace uh, because male unemployment was so high. Um, with regards to the, the statistics, that, that sort of general kind of, the statistics that I used in my um, paper was they were derived from census data. Um, so that is the, the you know, the, those are the f official statistics. Um, but the, there was no, certainly in the evidence that I have seen in newspapers and also through talking, you know, through oral history, oral histories with the interviewees, there doesn't seem to be the sort of same stigma attached to having to sign on for welfare support that would have maybe been perhaps attached to like Phil Coulter's song, uh, Men on the Dole Played a Mother's Role. That was something that the men have actively tried to remove themselves from, that narrative. Uh, they, they didn't really want to be perceived as house husbands, for want of a, of a better term. Um, so they, they almost seen it as, well, everybody finds it hard to get a job. So, you know, it's, it's fine. I, I can report as unemployed and I can seek social welfare assistance. So it was almost as if maybe being seen as a house husband was was worse in, in the social standing than uh, signing on for welfare. Anyone else from the panel want to comment? Uh, we'll move on to other questions then folks. I think Ewan has his hand up, Arthur. Ewan, go on, far away. And um, screen. Go on, Ewan. Thanks. I really enjoyed all the presentations, and it's it's sort of a comment and a question, which is a terrible thing to do. But I hope that um, maybe people pick up on it. And it was two related observations that pick up on what the the last question. Um, the first is that certainly, I think, in the the context that have largely been spoken about here, you don't get the same level of women's labour market withdrawal as you do male labour market withdrawal. And I think that that's significant. I've heard Andy, for instance, talk before about what the women that occupied the Lee Jeans factory went on to do afterwards. And that seems quite important in terms of how deindustrialization uh, affected you know, is, is integrated into narratives of, of life course and how it's understood collectively. Um, the second point is then what their daughters went on to do, as opposed to what their sons went on to do. That that seems hugely significant to me. And I think the the power of a, of a sort of a form of liberal feminist discourse, which says that each successive generation of women has done better than the last and has been more successful and more economically engaged, seems quite important there. And, and, you know, there will be some material reality to that in a lot of cases as well, I'm sure. So I'm wondering what, you know, in that sense, what, particularly those of you who have done oral history, what what did the, your respondents go on to do after they lost their industrial employment? And did they discuss what their daughters or their daughter's generation have, have taken up in the labour market since? Mm. Great, great comment question. Who wants to jump in from the panel? Anybody want to? Yeah, I, can, I can jump in, but I'm going to let someone else come in. I don't, I don't want to be talking too much. A comment and a question. How did it? It's four o'clock on a Friday afternoon, Ewan. No, it's, it's a really interesting point. I think that after the factory reconfiguration of identity is fundamentally gendered. And as, as you kind of touched on, one of the things that we've discussed previously is that unlike the kind of masculine discourse of having a good unionised job and then having to go into something that's seen as being less than that, for most of the women that I interviewed, they kind of conceded that post-factory they went on to what is socially perceived as better jobs. They went into um, the care sector, many worked in the National Health Service, some went on to qualify as being nurses. 
others working in, in high-end retail. So there was an interesting dynamic in the interviews that they talked about how much they missed industrial work and how much they missed the people that they worked with, while also recognising that in their own experiences, they had gone on to more desirable, um, more socially acceptable forms of work rather than, than working in factories. And that um, aspect about what, what, their, what their daughters went on to do was really interesting as well, because many of the women interviewed their daughters had gone to university and had gone on into kind of professional sectors. So there was this sense that although deindustrialization had impacted them, they'd fought against it, their personal circumstances had not been as significantly impacted as is the case in so many others. So I wonder if that's a really interesting, just small aspect of the gender and of the industrialization and how it impacts on the life course. I think those large kind of long life oral history interviews are really interesting and a, 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 an important way to capture that. But also I think that reusing old oral history interviews with women that experienced the industrialization with this kind of context of knowledge would be really interesting to kind of interrogate that further to, to look back at previous projects to see where we can see that. Because most of us do focus on deindustrialization as a dis displacement, um, something that was, was fought against, but it's interesting in thinking about the life course and the life experience post-closure as well. Um, I would just like to, to echo some of what Andy was saying um, with regards to the women who I've interviewed. Um, really, their, their sort of life trajectory afterwards, the, the, the shirt factories were very much uh, part of their formative years. Um, so a lot of them either went on, um, a few have, have stressed the importance of the fact that they went on to become stay-at-home mothers and then went back into the workforce afterwards. Um, but some, you know, one went on to be a nurse, another created her own dressmaking uh, business. You know, it was that kind of idea of they, they still harked back to being on the factory floor as, you know, the good old days. Um, but they did emphasize then that they moved on to something that would have been seen as, you know, maybe socially higher standing. Um, so it was, it's been very interesting also to kind of see that instead of, of emphasizing what subsequent generations have done their daughters or even their sons they have routinely harked back to what it was like for their own mothers um so the you know the the line kept coming up time and time again i had it better than than my mother did and her experience of the factory was way worse than mine so it was almost like um trying to emphasize the fact that their social standing was better than their mothers even when they were in the factories and then afterwards they sort of progressed on after that to to do things that were maybe seen as more worthwhile in society which sounds a horrible way of putting it but you know what I mean that sort of that idea but at the same time they never ever expressed this idea that has been seen in maybe Wales and there were some examples in the in, uh, down south in Ireland that factory work was almost a very, very low social standing. At no point did they prescribe to that idea. Uh, the factory days were, you know, really the, the highlight for them. Thanks, Tammy. Uh, Rory, you wanted to come in there? Yeah, sorry, my, my internet connection's playing up a little, so I just had to turn off the, the video to save on the bandwidth. Um, I think it's a really, really interesting point that Ewan raises. One thing I was actually struck by during interviews of uh, women textile workers were the, were the number that could sort of trace a lineage from the mother or the grandmother working in textile factories and them working in textile factories, but not their own daughters working in textile factories. And there certainly wasn't a... Uh, any sort of sadness or loss that their, their daughters hadn't gone into that work and there was a, more a sense of pride that they were going into further in higher education and going into perceived more respectable, higher status, higher paying uh, roles and feeling as if the lot for the next generation was better than it had been uh, for themselves. But, but interestingly, a lot of the women also touched on how they taught their daughters to sew on the sewing machine in the house, and uh, on two, two or three of the houses that I had visited, the woman had actually uh, taken like a spare room and converted it and had two and three different 
industrial sort of sewing machines in it, and they actually done that as a as a piece of sort of side work, uh, not sort of paid, but just for family and friends. They would make uh, like their, their grandchildren's uh, Halloween costumes on it. They would make uh, decorations for the house, like curtains and uh, cushion covers and, and uh, the likes of that. So there was this kind of longer trajectory around, I think, skill uh, that they passed on to their own daughters and they continued to work, uh, continued to use after their formal work in the factory had ended, which I thought was really interesting. But I also just wanted to touch on on what a lot of these women, where they, where they went after uh, the, the redundancies in the textile industry. There was obviously a, a huge range, but I, I would say there's broadly two categories with particularly older workers going into sort of caring services, whether that be uh, local social care through local authorities or going into hospitals uh, to do some form of uh, caring work in there as auxiliary nurses most commonly or as working as ward receptionists and, and that kind of work. So mainly within the falling into that low paid, traditionally feminised sector. Uh, but there were a, a, a group of younger workers who maybe were only about between 25 and 35 when they were finally made redundant from the textile industry. And, and although they reflect all these emotions of sadness and reflect on the textile industry as being uh, the happiest days of their working life, have went on to secure jobs of significantly higher pay, significantly higher status, and it's sort of professional roles working within the university sector, working within uh, human resources. Uh, so so there's, I think there's quite a generational divide in terms of those two distinct trajectories that, that women followed uh, following leaving the textile factory. But as I say, I think it's important to note that they still a lot of them still maintain those, those skills that they learned in the textile factory and still pass them on to the daughters or still practice them themselves in their sort of leisure time. Thanks, Roy. Uh, Amber, I think um, you're going to respond next. Yeah, I just um, would quickly just sort of echo the type of responses that um, Rory was talking about. I worked on an oral history project with women um, a few years back now um, and definitely found that a lot of them, after being made redundant in factories, went on to work into the expanding care economy, which in many ways grew out of the industrial age because you had so many um, men and women with so many physical ailments and injuries that the care economy grows out of it. But something that I found that is, um, I remember at the time that just come back to me is that there was actually quite a difference between different types of factory workers. And, I've, and just in this wee project that I worked on, women who worked in uh, mills, textile factories, very fond memories, talked about the um, camaraderie, the friendship, um, and looked back on it really well. But women who'd worked in things, and this is possibly something that comes up more in coal fields where it is semi-agrarian, but like food processing factories, which we have quite a lot of in Fife, but you think of it as a coal field, um, that, was, that wasn't even con often considered work. It was just something that women were glad to get out of. Um, and whether they had been um, gone on to, uh, if they just sort of gone into redundancy afterwards or into other work, it wasn't even something that they wanted to talk about, which I think is interesting. The silence of, of just not wanting to go there. Um, and it does sound, it did sound very, very physically, uh, physically demanding. And um, so, yeah, that was my take on it. Different types of factories, different types of responses. So thank you. Thanks, Amber. Thanks, Amber. Um, anybody else on the panel want to come in on this? Uh, well, I noticed from the chat, uh, uh, Stephen, you, you were uh, commenting Jack, Jackie on that. Has her, Jackie has her hand up, sorry. Yeah. Oh, oh, Jackie, is it on this issue or did you want to come in on something else? Yeah, actually, I wouldn't mind a yeah, quick follow-up on this on. issue. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Um, just sort of picking up on that really interesting question that, that you has raised, and it also connects to a couple of things that are in the chat, like Henry's question about the service sector and, you know, what's the story of women in the service sector? And in, in a sense, we're talking about that, that sort of transition. Um, and sort of Stephen's prompt in the chat as well um, about how this plays out in other countries. Uh, obviously, Scotland seems to be the hub of deindustrialization studies, according to this meeting today. But um, so I suppose that's partly about who happens to be in the project at the moment. But uh, um, but um, I guess 
well, a couple of things. One is I think the question of what kinds of transitions women make, women factory workers make um, when they leave industrial employment or are kicked out of industrial employment um, depends partly on the period. And obviously the periodization of deindustrialization is different in different countries. Um, and it also depends a lot on their age. Um, and that question of, of age becomes very um, significant in a kind of intersectional way, I think, for women in their kind of a, a sort of post and kind of factory employment um, opportunities. So, um, so in the case that I'm most familiar with, which is the, um, the sort of Moulinex case in France, um, so, um, so there are some factory closures from Moulinex in, in 96, 97, but the, the, the big ones in 2001, when the company goes bust, there's another four factories close. And um, in that context, a lot of women do, if they, they either don't find, well, most of them never find full-time work again. Um, and many of them are in receipt of some kinds of kind of like early retirement kind of benefits or, or a kind of scheme where they're paid because they were exposed to asbestos in their earlier um, um, part of their working lives. But um, those who do find uh, alternative employment, it, it is typically in the service sector, but it's low paid part time precarious work. It's like it's like cleaning hours for, for agencies and or um, sort of childminding work and stuff like that. I mean, childminding work is one of the more um, sort of desired things because you can sort of fit it around your family life and uh, um, and so on. But um, but so but again, that's not um, so the story of women kind of it's not necessarily always a story of women women entering kind of better jobs in the service sector in the way that a lot of the women that Andy was talking about seemed to have. So those two different kind of now. Of course, I'm talking about women who lost their jobs in the beginning of the 21st century. Um, and, and Andy's talking about a sort of slightly earlier um, generation. And that may make a difference to exactly what's happening to service work at that time and, and, and you know, how far that, how precarious that work is um, as well. So just some thoughts on that. Mm, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jackie. Um, so I was just going to um, uh, drag us back um, to a, a conversation in the in the chat between Stephen and Marion, uh, and just invite Marion to, um, if she wanted to elucidate on those questions that are being raised there. Uh, yeah, I think Stephen's question was on, uh, um, and there was also a good point made by Natalie as well, Natalie Thompson on, and I didn't have time to to explain this. The fact that this feminization was not only linked to the fact that there was a short uh, recruitment issue, but also that there was a, a significant pool of women's player, thanks to uh, also the expansion of instrumental tuitions in schools, uh, which significantly um, expanded from the 1960s which also explains uh, why um, more and more um, girls from a young age uh, joined brass bands, uh, which was also combined with more traditional forms of instrumental teaching in the family um, and, and through their fathers, especially. Um, so that's also an important point. And, and Stephen was asking about other types of mu musical activities in the coal, coal field and the, the place of women in them. Um, I don't have all of the sources to compare, but they were definitely present in um, in dance bands playing jazz music from the interwar years, and this is also what fostered uh, their presence in brass bands because they were uh, important uh, complementarities between playing in the brass band uh, during the week and playing in a dance band at the weekend. Uh, so playing trumpet instead of cornet and, and making, uh, making some uh, extra money. Uh, and there were also women playing in, in rock bands from the 1950s onwards. Um, and then um, we can also see women in, in choirs, uh, operatic societies, 
uh, and pipe bands as well. And I was saying that it could be interesting to see because because pipe bands are also a very hierarchical um, world in Scotland so with contests as well. And I think it could be interesting to compare to see if the chronology is the same. And I was saying that maybe Andy, uh, who's a piper himself, has, has more information on uh, the feminization of, of pipe bands. Andy. I'm such a I'm such a walking stereotype. The Scottish guy plays the bagpipes. It's great, but no, you, and you're you're completely right, Marion. It's something that we'd spoke about before because, as well as the brass bands and, and the Coalfields pipe bands, were really related to that as well. And there's since the period of closure, there's been two really drastic, dramatic changes in traditional music in Scotland that are both cl class related and and gender related. As you say, the feminisation of pipe bands has been has been a massive change since the 1980s. You now have um, bag pipe bands that will have um, maybe double figures women involved when previously it was very much a male only organisation. Now you have entire sections of the pipe band that are predominantly made up of, of women and, 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 and the younger age groups, particularly um, school girls as well. But the class dynamic, and I'm not sure how this plays out in the brass bands, is that that tuition that you talked about, either from parents or from the, the, the community within the coal fields, that's never been really satisfactorily replaced in large parts of Scotland. And what you've had now is that bagpipe and drumming tuition in Scotland has very much become a middle class pastime because it's private schools have the are the, the key places that have resources um to, to to pay for tuition and so that kids can get it in state education there's been a large campaign in scotland recently trying to encourage the government to to fund um traditional music tuition but when it is done I'm, i don't want to speak out of turn but i know there's no one in the chat that will shout at me but when it's done at the state level it's often not great so the best tuition in scotland now in traditional music is through private education which is again a sea change from the kind of musical culture that that emerged and, and continued in, in those kind of industrial communities. Um, so there's the, the benefit that now many more women are involved, but there's the negative aspect that it's become an incredibly, an increasingly expensive pastime only available to a, a kind of certain group within Scotland's um, youth. Thanks, Andy. Other questions or comments, folks? Do jump in if I've missed anything in the chat um, that anybody wants to return to. I'm Rebecca. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Rebecca has her hand up. <laughs> Go on, Rebecca. I just wanted to address uh, Stephen's question about um, gender being central to the understanding of the industrialization of Scotland. He asked if it, if this is also seen in the US and, and, and absolutely, I just, my presentation was focused on what I was currently researching, but uh, throughout the Piedmont area of the Southern part of the United States, it had a major effect, um, the deindustrialization of the textile industry. Not only did it have effect on women workers, but on families as well, because most of those the, that area of uh, southeastern United States was dotted with very small communities, single industry communities, and the housing was connected to employment. So when those mills closed, people also lost their homes and not only their, their livelihood, but their homes along with it. So there are entire ghost towns that you can still find in the southeastern part of the United States that used to be built around the, the cotton industry that are no longer. So it didn't just have a, a central gendered effect, but also a, a, a overall family effect as well, the ending of the textile industry. Mm, thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Uh, Sean, see your hand up far away. Yeah, thanks, Arthur. It's kind of a part observation, part of question, I guess. Um, I'm just thinking about the, the location of all the various industries and, and the case studies of, of where they, um, the workers that we've been talking about today uh, were, were placed. And I'm, so I'm, I'm thinking primarily about Naomi's paper, which is um, interesting in, in, in many respects and 
one of the interesting things I find out about I find about it is the the extent to which people know about uh, in Derry know about the role of of the women uh, shirt factory workers and their economic role in families and what have you. But ultimately, the inability for of the city or uh, you know the politicians in the city to really make adequate uh, or create adequate commemorations of that place or, the, or those workers and those women. And it, I wonder to what extent that whether Naomi, what you would think that's down to the troubles and the impact of the of new forms of you know we've talked about masculinity and leisure to extent uh, and associational culture well the, the big associational culture in Derry in the 1970s and the 1980s and the 1990s was kind of armed conflict or or parading and uh, and various other forms of masculinity which in some cases took the place of work in other places they were additional to work so if you joined the Ulster Defence Regiment for example that was a new form of masculine work for particularly for, for Protestant male workers so I'm, I'm just wondering whether you know maybe Naomi can kick off with an answer on this one where she thinks that that fits in as part of the analysis that she might have to make at the end of the day and whether, how it fits in with some of the other uh, case studies some of the, the locational issues maybe that make um, the, the stories or the the outcomes of the story is different in di in different locations, and maybe some of those who are working on uh, the west of Scotland, in particular, might chip in in terms of of, of sectarianism. Does, did, is sectarianism part of the story when it comes to to gender and deindustrialization, or is that a bit of a? Am, am I looking at this from a, a north, very through very Northern Irish eyes in that respect? Naomi, want to? Yeah, I think I would, I would definitely agree with you with regards to memorialization um, and the sort of priority of the local government uh, for memorialization of the, the shirt making industry. Um, but really the, the whole political system, the whole, the troubles, the violence, uh, the fact that the dairy is still a very, very socially deprived area as well. You know, it's almost the idea of, well, we have bigger fish to fry. Um, when memorialization is talked about at the local council level and in the local press it's always done with how much is this going to cost us how long is it going to be you know it's all the, these sort of economic um things going on you know there's even a case that um the city was gifted a light installation and i've talked a little bit about this um in the blog post that i'm gonna uh plug <laughs> while i'm here um on the deindustrialization website but the, the stitch in time light installation, there was a massive, um, very, very heated debate that was gifted to the city and the council said, well, it's gonna cost us too much money to keep it going. Um, so uh, memorialization of the industry is always talked about in a local government le level through the eyes of right cost. But for the people, um, for the people when they're talking about memorialization of the industry it's there's the huge sort of cultural significance of it um and it's kind of getting to the stage now where talks of cost and how much it's going to cost them to memorialize it is not going to wash anymore and i think it's because we've moved into a more sort of post-conflict society now um where the emphasis is very much on jobs um you know what can we do to make dairy more attractive for investments um and you know, unfortunately, we, you know, we had a massive industry of shirt making, and now that has almost moved to a massive industry of call centers. Um, so it's, it's even intergenerational. It's kind of, you know, we're still in a position of that sort of very socially deprived um, existence. But yeah, definitely. But interestingly as well, the, the, the women and the men that I've, I've talked, uh, talked to about the, the shirt making industry, stories about the violence that was going on was very tangential to what they wanted to talk about and they often didn't want to talk about the troubles and what was going on because it was seen as almost something that was above above their pay grade in a way um you know that was for the politicians to sort out and think about uh, whether as they always always come back to memorialization in today's society when talking about it Thanks, Naomi. Uh, Lauren, do I have time to, to ask um, other members of the panel to respond here, or do we need to wrap things up? Um, I mean, it's up to you. I see that Stephen has his hand up. I don't know if he wanted to say some closing words, or it's, it's up to you guys. 
Yeah, Stephen, do you have closing words to say or was it a comment? Not closing you? words. I was just going to okay. sort of come around to what Jackie said at the beginning that, that over the next three years, we'll be focusing on gender and thinking about gender in the context of deindustrialization. I guess my, my, my question would be to the panelists that, you know, what, what, what does the field need to do, right? Like stepping back from your, your case studies, right? Your specific projects and thinking about the historiography and, you know, what the literature has, you know, is saying today, where, where, where do we need to go? I guess that would be my my question. It's not a comment. Anyways, I'm curious. <laughs> I'm not sure in uh, in two minutes, uh, Steve, we've got time to answer that. But it's I mean, it's a it's a great question for us to to take forward uh, within within the group. Um, and we're meeting again next week, Jackie. I think, aren't we? Uh, to to try and you know push uh, uh, push this stuff on. Um, I, I was just going to say. Um, yeah, the, 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 all the papers I thought were, were, were fantastic and really, really makes us think about um, the, the nature of masculinity and femininity and how deindustrialization impacts upon those identities. And one thing that was kind of missing from, from this session for me, um, but maybe I missed it, is the, um, uh, the kinds of impacts of deindustrialization, job loss for both women and men on gender relations within the home. And I think that's another part of that, you know, to partly answer that question about going forward, Steve, I think that's an important part of the agenda to think about uh, family and home and how those relationships, um, uh, gender roles within the family, um, the nature of patriarchy has been affected by, um, by, this, by the deindustrialization process. Uh, I know I'm rabbiting on, but um, I think we've only got a minute or two, folks. Anybody want to quickly respond to that? Jackie, maybe, I don't know, or members of the panel? I was just open quickly. It's just it's something that I talk about in the book that deindustrialization is a kind of fledgling scholarly field, if you like, and it's burgeoning, it's grown so much over the last 20 years that I think there's perhaps a tendency, and many of us have been guilty of it, to think about what the next thing is going to be. What do we move on to next? Where do, where do we take this? And I think that what we see through the research on, on women's experiences is that to move the urge to move away from the factory. I mean, it was 2003 that they talked about moving beyond the ruins. It means that we actually left lots of scholarship behind. And actually, one of the first things that we have to do is actually think about what is missing before thinking about where we then move on to. What what voices aren't there? You mentioned in the chat, Stephen, about LGBTQ experience of deindustrialization. So again, returning to the factory, returning to the industrial to try and excavate those memories or sites of memory, I think is really quite important. But I will. Be quiet now. Any other final comments or reflections? If not, folks, uh, it, is, um, it is just about uh, five o'clock British time. Uh, we probably should, uh, should tie things up. Um, many, many thanks to the, to the seven presenters for, for wonderful, stimulating uh, talks, uh, really leading us into into our field in, in, in really buzzy ways. I've got lots and lots of notes and lots and lots of questions. Um, so many thanks to our, to our seven speakers first up. And of course, many thanks to all of you for coming along and participating and for, for great comments and, and questions. So many thanks to all, thank you.